order. Questions to the Prime Minister. Yeah. Stella Creasy. Yeah. Prime Minister. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, this morning I had meetings with ministerial colleagues and others, and in addition to my duties in this House, I shall have further such meetings later today. Stella Creasy. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Our allies are warning of a dangerous gap between us and America on this. So can the Prime Minister tell us, for the next Parliament, what is more important to him, protecting our armed forces or introducing tax cuts? What is important is combining economic security and national security. And the two go together. We inherited a £38 billion black hole in our defence budget. And because of the excellent stewardship of the economy by this Chancellor and this Government, we've filled that gap. We're investing in defence. Our economy is strong and our country is safe. Mr James Arbuthnot. Is my right honourable friend aware that in the post office mediation scheme, the post office has just sacked the independent investigators, second sight, and told them to destroy all their papers. Does my right honourable friend agree that it is essential that the second sight's second report should not be suppressed but should be supplied to sub postmasters and MPs, yeah. starting with the honourable member for West Bromwich West and the Biz Select Committee? Yeah. Yeah. I think my right honourable friend makes a very important point. I know he's consistently raised concerns by some sub postmasters about the operation of the post office IT system and the post office mediation scheme. It's an issue the Business Select Committee is currently taking evidence on, and they should be given all the relevant information. While the government should not interfere with the independent mediation process, I will ask the business secretary to write to him about this concern and make sure the business committee can do its job properly. Yeah. Miliband. Mr Speaker, le- less than two months ago, the Prime Minister said in this House he wanted a head-to-head debate between me and him. He, 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 said, it, he, said, he, said, it was, he said it was game on. When did he lose his nerve? I said to him, if he wants a debate, I've offered a date. The week starting the 23rd of March. Why won't he say yes to it? Speaker, I'm going to be at the debate. I'm going to be at the debate set by the broadcasters on April the 2nd and 16th. But I'm asking him about the two-way debate between me, between him and me. Now, Mr. Speaker, the original proposal for the two-way debate didn't come from me, it didn't come from the broadcasters, it came from him, Mr Speaker. He said this, I've suggested we need a debate where the two people who can actually be Prime Minister directly debate each other. If there was a good proposal then, if it's a good proposal now, why doesn't he just name the day? Prime Minister. He said, any time, any place, anywhere. I've told him, the 23rd of March, let's hold that debate. But I'll tell him what has changed. We've now got a situation where it's obvious Labour can't win without the SNP. He says, he says, we need the two leaders. We need the two leaders who can call the tune. That's me and Alex Salmon. So let's have the debate. Mr Speaker, Mr Speaker, he says, he says it is all about leadership. He says it is about it he says it is about him and me. Order. Nobody in the House of Commons, the government chief whip shouldn't be smirking about it, it's not a laughing matter. Nobody in the House Order Nobody in the House of Commons should be shouted down. And I've got news for members, however long it takes, it is not go. It is not going to happen. Members will be heard. Ed Miliband. Mr Speaker, these are pathetic, feeble excuses. Can we now take it that there are no circumstances that he will debate me head-to-head between now and the general election? We've had four years of debates and we found out he's got no policies, he's got no plan, he's got no team, he's got no clue of running the country. But the truth, Mr Speaker, is this. Labour are now saying they cannot win the election. Here is the leaflet they put out in Scotland. Ah, 
I think the, the SNP might be interested in this. At the general election, we need to stop the Tories being the largest party. They're not trying to win, they're just trying to crawl through the gates of Downing Street on the coattails of the SNP. So what he's got to do is prove that he's not a chicken and rule that out. Yeah, there's only one per person. There's only one person preparing for defeat, and it's this Prime Minister. Now he's not gonna he's not gonna be able. He's not going to be able to wriggle off this. This is what he said. This is what he said before the last general election. He said this. We have the opportunity to debate a prime minister's questions, but that is a very different matter to a proper television debate during a general election campaign. And he said this. When Parliament is not sitting and when people will be most receptive to engaging in political discussion. Now, Mr Speaker, we know he lost to the Deputy Prime Minister last time. Why doesn't he just cut out the feeble excuses and admit the truth? He's already might lose again. Quite amazing. He wants to talk about the future of a television programme. I want to talk about the future of the country. Four, four questions. Four questions. Three weeks to go. He can't talk about jobs because we're growing jobs. He can't talk about unemployment because unemployment's plummeting. He can't talk about inflation because it's at a record low. The truth is, he's weak and despicable and wants to crawl to power in Alex Salmon's pocket. If he's, if he's so confident, if he's so confident, why is he chickening out of the debate with me? Everyone, everyone can see it. And Mr. Speaker, I'll tell you why this matters. I'll tell you why this matters. Because it goes to his character. It goes to his character. Because the public will see through his feeble excuses. Instead of these ridiculous tactics, why doesn't he show a bit more backbone and turn up for the head to head debate with me anytime, anywhere, any place? tell him what goes to character. Someone who is prepared to crawl into Downing Street in alliance with people who want to break up the future of our country. What a despicable and weak thing to do. Risking our defences, risking our country, risking our United Kingdom. If he had an ounce of courage, he'd rule it out. There's only one person, there's only one person who's a risk to the integrity of the United Kingdom, and it's this useless Prime Minister. Yeah. That question will be heard. The noise calculatedly being made by some members on both sides of the House is order, is a disgrace to the House of Commons. The right honourable gentleman will be heard, and the Prime Minister will be heard. That is the end of the matter. Ed Miliband. Speaker, there's only one person who's a risk to the integrity of our country, and that is this Prime Minister. And on the head-to-head -head debate, we've learnt something about him, Mr Speaker, because like all bullies, when the heat's really on, he runs for cover. He's been offered a debate and he won't take it. Any time, any place, anywhere, but he won't take it. The truth is, they've got nothing to say on policy, nothing to say on the economy. The only way into Downing Street is on Alex Salmon's coattails. It is an, al it is an alliance between the people who want to bankrupt Britain and the people who want to break up Britain, and the British people will never have it. Mr Alistair Burt. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. On the 25th of March, the Penrose Inquiry, which has been looking at the issue of the tragedy of contaminated blood in Scotland, will finally report, likely with implications for the rest of the United Kingdom. Because of the time scale, it's highly unlikely there can be a full response by this government before the end of Parliament. Would my right honourable friend, who has taken a great personal interest in this, as have now over 100 members of this House, give an assurance that the matter will not slip from his agenda or the government's agenda, and that as soon as possible in the new Parliament there will be an attempt at closing down 
this terrible tragedy in our country. Prime Minister. First of all, let me pay tribute to the right honourable gentleman who has led on this issue. But I suspect that members of Parliament in every constituency in the House have had constituents who had hepatitis C or HIV because of contaminated blood come into their surgeries, as I have, and tell very moving stories. I think it is right to wait for the Penrose inquiry. And let me be clear, that is not an excuse, because I want us to take action. I'm not sure the action we'll be able to take will ever fully satisfy those who want this wrong to be righted. But as a wealthy, successful country, we should be helping these people more. We will help these people more. We need Penrose first. And if I'm standing Standing here after the next election, it will be done. Yeah. 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 Mr. Douglas Carswell. <laughs> before the last election, before the last election, the Prime Minister repeatedly promised to cut immigration. Instead, it's gone up. Net immigration is now three times higher than he promised. Why has he failed? Well, we cut net migration from outside the European Union, but inside the European Union we've created more jobs than the rest of the European Union put together. And so now what we need to do is to reform welfare to make sure that people who come from other European countries cannot claim unemployment benefit, leave after six months without a job, and have to work for four years before they get tax credits. That's what you'll get if you get a Conservative government after the next election. Thank you, Mr. In celebrating International Women's Day, the Prime Minister can be congratulated in making it happen for women. We have more women in work than ever before, more female-led businesses than ever before, more females on boards than ever before, and more childcare provision than ever before. Given that women are core to the long-term economic plan, will my right honourable friends support the creation of a Women and Equality Select Committee to make sure that future governments do as much for women as this one has done? I I certainly join her in in agreeing to that. Look, of course, there is still disadvantage and barriers we have to break down in our country, but there are more women in work than ever before. The pay gap for the under-40s has been uh, eradicated. There's more that we're doing to help with childcare and people with caring responsibilities. And we've also uh, tried to help women around the world, not least by campaigning and working to cut out uh, FGM and also put an end to the horrors of forced marriage. I think this government does have a good record on promoting women's issues, women's rights, not just here in the UK, but right around the world. Lisa Nandy. Does he share my admiration for the Brick, a Wigan charity that last year gave out 6,000 food parcels to local families? Mm. And will he tell those families why, 30 years after the miners' strike, yet again our community is having to compensate for its heartless, hopeless government? Yeah. I'd be ashamed of that record. Is that why he won't go head to head and debate it? Yeah. Well, I, I tell him, I'll tell the Honourable Lady what we inherited in Wigan because we've seen uh, unemployment come down in terms of the claimant count by 44% since this government came to office. In the North West, we've seen 124,000 more people in work. Those are people able to provide for their families. That's what's happening, a growing economy, because we dealt with a mess left by the Honourable Lady and her party. Stephen Metcalf. Thank you, Mr Speaker. We can be rightly proud of our science and technology research base, but there is a danger that government spending on this important area is falling behind. When my right honourable friend is returned as Prime Minister in only a few weeks, will he commit to a real terms increase in the science budget, thus supporting Basildon's innovative industries and maintaining our world standing in the sciences, helping to create the high paid jobs that we need to deliver our long term economic plan? Honourable friend, it's absolutely right to mention science, and of course we ring fence the science budget during this Parliament because it's been absolutely essential to build the modern manufacturing and advanced economy that we want to see. You're also going to see excellent initiatives like the Newton Fund, the Alan Turing Institute, the Henry Royce Institute, all of these big investments in science in the next Parliament. Caroline Lucas. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's been estimated that entrenching market structures in the NHS like tendering, bidding and contracting to the private sector, costs over £10 billion a year. Why doesn't he think that money would be better spent on patient care? 
What we've done is actually save money by cutting out yeah, yeah. bureaucracy. So we're seeing an extra four and a half billion pounds go into the NHS. But if the honourable lady is saying there is no occasion at all where anyone from the independent sector or the charitable sector or the voluntary sector can help in our NHS, I think she's wrong. I think of the work that Macmillan Cancer Nurses do, that Marie Curie Cancer Care does, helping with the end of life. The idea that there's only one way to deliver health care in our brilliant NHS, expanding under this government, is completely wrong. Maria Miller. Despite record numbers of new jobs, people with a learning disability can still find it tough to get into work. Will the Prime Minister join me in welcoming the Basingstoke Inclusion Zone, which will recognise the commitment of local employers to people with a learning disability, people whose talents and ability in the workplace are too often hidden? Yeah. I certainly join my right hon. Friend in, in praising the great work of the Inclusion Zone, which is launching this Friday. Uh, what we need to do is build on the success we have already, with employment of disabled people up 141,000 over the last year. But this is uh, where we need not just a change in action, but also a change in culture, which is why the Disability Confident campaign is so important, of encouraging employers to join in and give employment opportunities to disabled people. We've now got over 1,000 employers employers committing to change their practices with disabled people, and I want to see this go right across the country. Yeah. Naomi Long. I'm sure the Prime Minister will want to join me in congratulating Titanic Belfast, which this week beat competition from the London Eye and the Eiffel Tower to become the best international group visitor attraction. Does he therefore share my frustration and anger that in the same week the much bigger prize of political stability and economic progress is being jeopardised by Sinn Féin reneging on promises made in the Stormont House Agreement? First of all, let me join the Honourable Lady in praising uh, the Titanic project and exhibition. I've been and seen it myself. It is absolutely brilliant in terms of a visitor attraction and a yet another reason to visit uh, Belfast for people not just around our United Kingdom but around Europe and around the world. I agree with her that what matters is now implementing the Stormont Agreement and everyone should do what they signed up to do in that agreement, Sinn Féin included. And I know that my uh, right honourable friend, the Northern Ireland Secretary, is working very hard to try to make sure everyone Everyone fulfills their pledges. Mark Hunter. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Will the Prime Minister join me in paying tribute to the many dedicated health professionals who work at St Anne's Hospice in my Cheadle constituency? And does he agree with me that the decision to devolve £6 billion worth of NHS spending to Greater Manchester presents a tremendous opportunity to better integrate healthcare services? and secure a more positive long-term funding arrangement for our local hospices. Yeah. I totally agree with my hon. Friend. and Actually, the hospice movement is another good example of something which provides vital health and social services in our country, which is not necessarily owned and, op and, and, op and operated by the NHS. I'm a parent who used a hospice in Oxford regularly and was absolutely amazed by the brilliant work that they do. So what we've done is allocated over £100 million of capital funding to hospices since 2010. This has been in addition to the £10 million to the children's hospices. I would welcome both that NHS money is being made more available to hospices, as he says, and also the Manchester uh, decision, the Greater Manchester decision, I think is a way of making sure decisions are made between local authorities and the NHS and are made closer to the patients that they're serving. Paul Farrelly. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, a leaked NHS report uh, shows a looming deficit of 200 million in Staffordshire in three years' time. Ten more of these were commissioned last year into distressed local health economies around the country. And yet, after repeated stonewalling, health ministers are now saying, and I quote, consultancy firms were not commissioned to re produce reports on the local health economies as described in the question. So, could I ask the Prime Minister? Election or low, no election, why is the government engaged in a cover up of what lies in store for large parts of the NHS around the country? Uh, there's a pattern, Mr. Speaker, which is Labour MPs in Staffordshire are determined to try and frighten people about the future of the NHS. And they are 
are the last people who should do it after the appalling mess they made in mid Staffordshire. What we're seeing is 12.7 billion more money going into our NHS, a strong future for the NHS in Staffordshire, which will be continued as long as I'm in this place. Mr. Greg Mulholland. Mr Speaker, this is the third time in four months that I have raised at Prime Minister's questions NHS England letting down the 180 or so people with ultra-rare dis- diseases, some of whom are outside the House today, who have been failed by the flawed process. Some of those children um, will lose access to their drugs from May and their conditions will deteriorate irreversibly. We have two Prime Minister's questions left. Can he tell me in that time, will he announce when we'll get interim funding for these drugs that the children and these people need? My my honourable friend is absolutely right to raise this issue because these are very rare and debilitating conditions and there are drugs that can help uh, the children who have these conditions. My understanding, having looked at this, and I know that the uh, health and science ministers looked very carefully at it and met with the families and with the drug companies as well as with NHS England, and my understanding is that NHS England is holding a review. The review will be completed by the end of April and the companies are currently funding these drugs till the end of May. So I don't see any reason why there shouldn't be continuity of care and continuity of drugs. And that is what I hope we can achieve. Isla Stewart. Spending 2% of GDP on defence is not only significant as part of our NATO commitment, it's also an important commitment to be a reliable ally. Only last September, the Prime Minister still thought he was important when he lectured other NATO countries that they should meet Britain's commitment. Is he not just a little bit embarrassed that he himself has now reneged on that? This country has met its NATO commitments not only for 2%, but also to spend the money on deployable equipment and forces, which is just as important a commitment. But what I would say to the Honourable Lady is how does she feel about her leader contemplating a deal with the SNP who want to strip this country of their defences? That is what they're prepared to do. He won't rule it out. It says very clearly in his leaflets they're only trying to be the largest party. They're not trying to win a majority. That is the risk we face. No trident, no protection for our country, defence ripped bare by a Labour Party in hock to the SNP. Sir David Amis. With unemployment falling in the South End, enterprises expanding, 310 new businesses being created, will my right honourable friend describe to the House which government policies will see this recovery continuing so that the irresistible and unstoppable case for South End to be made a city uh, actually yeah, happens. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, well, can I once again commend him on the consistency of his campaign to see South End recognised in this way? He asked me what policies will make a difference and continue to bring businesses to South End. Well, we're cutting the jobs tax of businesses and charities. That's helping. We've got the lowest rate of corporation tax in the G7. That's helping. We're abolishing national insurance contributions for under-21s. We're extending the doubling of the small business rate relief, all of these things, and sticking to our long-term economic plan, as the OECD, IMF and others have advised us to, can make sure that South End can continue to grow and perform well. Rosie Cooper. Thank you, Mr yeah, yeah, Speaker. Yeah. In protecting uh, universal benefits, the Prime Minister said pensioners deserve dignity when they retire. Retired constituents in West Lancashire say, what's the point of a bus pass when there are no buses? Or even trains. Or even trains. (laughs) Or even trains as the Conservative Borough Council pocketed. Council pocketed the additional money, which would have been used to allow access to pen- pensioners' access to trains. So, will the Prime Minister do the right thing? The Honourable Lady needs to bring her question to a close, but that question, notwithstanding a display of very considerable rudeness, 
towards her will be heard. That's the end of it. It will be heard. However long it takes, it doesn't matter to me. Rosie Cooper. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Will the Prime Minister do the right thing and ensure that concessionary travel for all pensioners is fair and equitable? Prime Minister. Of course, buses are the responsibility of the County Council, and so I think the point made was a fair one. I have talked about dignity and security in retirement because we have kept our commitments and upgraded the pension by the triple lock, so pensioners in her constituency will have £950 more in terms of the basic state pension than when I became Prime Minister in 2010. We committed to keeping the free bus pass, keeping the television licence, keeping the freedom from prescription charges. We have kept each and every one of those promises. We have gone beyond that by saying to pensioners that they do not need to buy an annuity. It is their money, their savings. They can spend it as they choose. This has been a government that has recognised people deserve that dignity and security, and we have delivered in full. Annette Brooke. Thank you, Mr Speaker. 75 per cent of our schools contain asbestos. More than 20 teachers a year are dying from exposure to asbestos. Our children are known to be particularly vulnerable. Will the Prime Minister ensure that the Government publishes its completed policy review on asbestos in schools before dissolution? Well, the Honourable Lady, my Honourable Friend, raises um, a, a very important issue, uh, which was well broadcast and covered on the media in the last couple of days. That's why we're carrying out an asbestos review, going through all of the schools, and we will publish it in due course, and action will have to be taken. Mr David Blunkett. Yeah. Yeah. Mr Speaker, I, I was thinking of raising, uh, with the Prime Minister, the Conservative so-called long-term economic plan. Yeah. Which, uh, which, like Pinocchio's nose, grows longer and less attractive by the day. But I thought, with just two Prime Minister's questions to go, I'd ask the Prime Minister whether he shared uh, my imminent relief that neither he nor I will have to pencil in 12 noon on a Wednesday any longer. Can I um, take this opportunity, as he will be shortly leaving this House, to pay tribute to the Right Honourable Gentleman. I will never forget, as a new backbencher, coming to this place in 2001 and seeing him in the light of the appalling terrorist attacks that had taken place across the world, the strong leadership that he gave on the importance of keeping our country safe. Uh, he is a remarkable politician, a remarkable man. I remember once in the Home Affairs Select Committee, uh, even though he could not see who we all were, he knew exactly who was concentrating and who was not. I do not know how he has this extraordinary uh, gift, um, but he is an extraordinary politician, and I, I pay tribute to him. And I know the rest of the House will join me. Mr. Nigel Adams. Thank you. The Prime Minister rightly warned during his conference speech that those voters flirting with UKIP that if they went to bed with Nigel Farage on May the seventh, they could end up waking up with a leader opposition on uh, May the eighth. <laughs> Can I put it to the Prime Minister that the outcome could actually be a lot more unpleasant? Is it not now the case that if voters go to bed with Nigel Farage on May the 7th, not only could they wake up with the Leader Opposition, but they could also end up snuggled up next to Alex Salmond? I mean, that, that is the point. Who knows who you could wake up in bed with? It might not just be Alex Salmond, it, it might be uh, Nigel Farage, it, it, it could be any number of people. And what's interesting? Yeah, yes, of course. Uh, of course, that's an option too. It all points to the difference between the competence of the Conservatives and the chaos of the alternative. Yeah. Mr Gregory Campbell. <laughs> Thank you, Mr yeah. Speaker. Pe people in Northern Ireland have once more had the sexual abuse issue put under the spotlight as members of the IRA stand accused of holding kangaroo courts, re-traumatising victims as a result. Will the Prime Minister help to establish a cross-border inquiry 
with the power to call key witnesses in order to try and bring some form of closure and justice to young people particularly who have been abused and their abusers have been sheltered by the IRA. The Minister. Well, I will look carefully at what the Honourable Gentleman has said. Of course, in the Stormont House Agreement, there are a set of measures and proposals to try and deal with the issues of the past in a fair and accountable way, and perhaps this is one such issue that could be dealt with in that way. Caroline Dynage. Thank you, Mr yeah. Speaker. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. In Gosport, we have a very proud history of supporting the armed forces, yeah. and um, the recent £420 million contract to service the Chinook helicopter fleet will help local companies like Vector Aerospace to preserve those links. With that in mind, will the Prime Minister reassure us of his commitment to defence spending, to the defence industry, defence procurement and defence jobs? Yeah. I can certainly make that commitment, and we have said that the £160 billion equipment programme over the next decade is fully protected, will grow in real terms, and having been recently to Portsmouth to see for myself uh, the new um, uh, docks that are being put in to uh, welcome the Queen Elizabeth aircraft carrier and the massive investment that will go into Portsmouth in terms of ship servicing and of course her own constituency of Gosport will benefit from this uh, Chinook contract, a new order of Chinooks pumping money into our defence industry and also leading to the training of apprentices and jobs and livelihoods for many years to come. Mr Grant Davis. Mr Speaker, a couple with two children, with a man earning £25,000, the woman earning £10,000, will be £9,417 worse off in tax credits if they stay together as opposed to if they break up. Is this brutal attack on working families yet another reason he won't go head-to-head -head in a pre-election debate with the Leader of the Opposition? What this government has done is obviously help all couples by lifting the first £10,600 that you earn out of tax, and we're the first government to introduce a married couple's tax allowance, which I seem to remember he voted against. So if he cares about couples, he cares about commitment, he should be help, he should be voting with us. Dan Bile. Thank you, Mr Speaker. and a privilege to be the Member of Parliament for North Warwickshire for the last five years. I am particularly proud that in that time crime in North Warwickshire has fallen. There are more doctors and more nurses in the George Eliot Hospital. The number of schools rated as needing improvement has halved. But perhaps most importantly, unemployment in North Warwickshire has fallen to the lowest level since constituency records began in 1983. Yeah, 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 yeah. Does the Prime Minister agree with me that this shows this isn't just empty rhetoric? It makes a real difference to people on the ground, gripping the economy, gripping the deficit, and having an effective long term economic plan. Yeah. Well, I pay tribute to my honourable friend and all the work that he's done. And the point is that the claimant count in North Warwickshire has come down by 70% since the election. The long-term youth claimant count come down by 64%. And I know that working with Craig Tracy, he'll work very hard to make sure that North Warwickshire continues to benefit from our long-term economic plan. Mr Jerry Sutcliffe. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. I think the Prime Minister may know that this could be my last uh, Prime Minister's questions after 20 happy years um, representing Bradford South. He'd be pleased to know that I'm making my retirement plans. What's his? <laughs> Can I congratulate him not only on his service in this House but also winning a by-election? I think any of us who've taken part in by-elections, and I remember the Bradford South by-election not entirely happily from my point of view, uh, knows what daunting prospects there are. We've all got plans for after May the 7th, people we want to spend more time with and less time with. Uh, I've got a little list. I suspect he's got one too. <laughs> Dr Julian Lewis. The Scottish National Party have been licking their lips in public at the prospect of blackmailing one of the two main parties into delaying or abandoning the replacement of the Trident submarines. Will the Prime Minister confirm that if he is still Prime Minister in 2016, as he should be, that he will certainly ensure that the main gate contracts for four successive submarines are signed that year. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I can reassure my honourable friend, for me, Trident and its replacement are non-negotiable. Yeah. They're an absolutely vital 
vital part of this nation's security. And let me just remind the party opposite, this is the leaflet going out across Scotland and it says this, at the general election we need to stop the Tories being the largest party. They've given up trying to be the government, they've given up trying to win a majority, they want to crawl into Downing Street on the coattails of the SNP and put our country at risk. The British people will never have it. Um, Mr Speaker, 17,000 police officers have gone in this Parliament. Under the Chancellor's spending plans, another 30,000 would go in the next Parliament. The outgoing President of the Association of Chief Police Officers, Sir Hugh Ward, has warned that it would no longer be possible adequately to protect the public from criminals or from the growing threat of homegrown terrorists. Is he right? What, what we've seen in this Parliament is, yes, we have made difficult decisions on police spending, but crime is down, including crime in the West Midlands is down. And as for the Shadow Chancellor's dossier this week, well, he briefed against it before we even had a chance. I, I've heard of someone, I've heard of him briefing against the leader, but he's beaten his own records. He now briefs against himself. Order!